And then finally, Craig. Well, thank you to the organizers, but uh, no thanks for having to speak after Donna and Ray. Um, those are some tough acts to follow, and uh, I have confidence that you, you got an A in that course in Harvard. <laughs> so um, when we were thinking about remote and virtual trials, a lot of the thinking there is analogous to a lot of the thinking that you can draw from the work of Clayton Christensen around centralization and decentralization. And the idea that in computing and now in healthcare, there is a, a wave of centralization that can enable tremendous new opportunities that can be decentralized. Um, we see that with large health systems and large uh, uh, referral hospitals that create opportunities for mini clinics in the community and for healthcare to become less centralized and pushed out into the community. Those same attributes pull through when we're thinking about clinical trial conduct. There's a, uh, there are certain things that we have centralized in clinical trials, multi-center clinical trials for a long time, labs, image reads, EKGs, certain diagnostic data. Increasingly, many of us aspire more and more towards the use of central IRBs. And in reality, this is just the next wave of centralization because these studies still have an investigator. Um, an investigator is, is, is a necessity today, not only for ethical and, and legal uh, and regulatory requirements, but just for oversight around the patient's safety. But the opportunity here is what happens when we centralize that role and centralize the role of the coordinator today and what kind of decentralization is then possible. And when we take that approach, how does that decentralization improve access, reduce burden, improve the ability for more representative patients to participate. As Ray kindly mentioned, um, I, I worked on the remote trial at Pfizer, and I didn't do that alone. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's exciting for me to see Steve Cummings in, in the room, who uh, was our, our thought leader and partner on that work, and I'm looking forward to hearing from him as uh, on the agenda. Uh, the remote trial uh, was uh, a clinical trial that we put together to test the methodology. We were repeating a brick and mortar registration trial that was done for Detrol, an overactive bladder, and strung together at the time a series of what we thought of as modules, most of which already existed in some way or shape or form. The idea of recruiting patients online wasn't radical or novel. The idea of using ePro or capturing patient reported outcomes on a technology wasn't radical or novel. It was more stringing that and others together and filling in some spaces where needed with, um, with approaches that were novel, like our ability to distribute a drug directly to the patient. In the end, we discontinued the remote study early. We failed to recruit the woman with d disease severity that we were looking for for that trial. The other modules in that, uh, in that study worked in terms of our ability to screen and consent and monitor for safety and capture the data that was required, whether for efficacy or safety. I'd like to remind folks that nobody was fired, nobody died, nobody went to jail. There was nothing that was done there, whether uh, during the conduct of the study or during audits or inspections that followed, everything was all doable, and this was back in 2010. So to build on Ray's point earlier, we're not operating at the upper limit of technology today. We're not operating at the upper limit of technology in 2010. We're not operating at the upper limit of regulation. We did not need um, special new legislation to pass or a special new guidance from regulators in order for that study to be done. Um, so the regulatory and technical framework existed and it still exists. It's really, as Ray mentioned, it's a matter of will. Now, 
Uh, one thing that you know I do think is has been remarkable in the evolution in the industry in the time since remote, and much of this is really in just the last two to three years. You see companies that are uh, starting up in the space and extremely well capitalized and supported. You see established uh, CROs and large technology companies in this space that are, are in the clinical trial space that are launching capabilities or acquiring capabilities specifically for this type of model. Um, you see initiatives in Europe like um, IMI, the Innovative, Innovative Medicines Initiative, with uh, a work stream focused on remote trials in Europe. You have initiatives like CITI, the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, and their awesome work around mobile clinical trials, which included recommendations around decentralized trials. In many ways, this feels more and more like a mainstream conversation now. This is not a, a fringe conversation. This is action at the national academies, at the IMI, at City, and among some of the largest CROs and technology companies. It seems to be what's missing is all of the move beyond the pilots. And I look forward to talking more about that during the course of this session. Now, I, I think that I, I see often um, in, in slides, this, this impression that's painted that we're starting today with brick and mortar trials and that um, hybrid studies with select visits happening from home is kind of the middle ground and that uh, things being fully remote and virtual is necessarily the desired end state. But I would argue that there's a click beyond that, 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 that we refer to as location flexibility. Now, the reason I draw that difference is, for most studies, when we talk about hybrid, when we talk about select visits happening from home, what that really means is the protocol was written in a way that said visits two, five, and seven can happen in the home. That's not the patient choosing how and where they want to participate. That's still protocol-centric rather than patient-centric in how it's defined. And for that reason, I would argue that the desired end state here is to be able to construct protocols that let patients choose their own adventure and let them decide where they want to participate for those visits. Is that one going to be in the home? Is it going to be in Florida because that's where they are for that time of the year? Is it going to be in the clinic because, boy, it's the holiday season and I don't really want to have a visiting nurse come to my house right now? We're busy and I'd rather go to the clinic for that visit. Um, that's really hard, right? Because that means we have to have processes that can flex based on different patient needs, and that means we have to have endpoints that are way more resilient than the extremely fragile endpoints that we rely on today. So what are the obstacles that stand in our way today? Well. While, we, while I do argue that we don't operate at the upper limit of regulation today, there, are, there is variability in regulation, both for domestic trials here in the U.S., state by state, variability when it comes to rules around telemedicine and Internet prescribing, which need to be taken into consideration for this type of a study, as well as the country by country variability and, and willingness uh, and familiarity with the model. I think it is extremely important for us as we think about obstacles to make sure that we are not marginalizing treating physicians. Most of the patients that we're looking to enroll in a randomized trial for a new medicine are patients who already have a diagnosis and most, off, most frequently already have an existing course of therapy. They already have a prescription. So they already have a treating physician in their lives. The opportunity of virtual trials is not to marginalize that individual, but to empower them. How can virtual trials complement the treating physician so that they don't have to become an investigator and on a 1572 and all of the burden and responsibility that comes with that, but where virtual trials can complement their practice, where they wouldn't necessarily look at a patient being referred to someone else's trial as a loss of revenue, but an opportunity for them. And then, as I mentioned, the importance around endpoints. Our endpoints today, I believe, are going to be very quickly be the rate limiter after will in culture 
our endpoints in general are not robust enough to be able to withstand acquisition in variable locations. That's why we need clinicians like Dr. Dorsey to see and to touch the patient because our endpoints too often just aren't there. We have initiatives in my company, and I'm sure most companies have the same, to invest around digital biomarker development. And it's also an area of action today across many of the uh, collaborations and consortia, IMI, Critical Path Institute, Transcelerate, um, and I would also point to the uh, leadership of Dr. Dorsey in helping to introduce a uh, journal in the space to help um, mature the field of digital biomarkers. I wanted to raise one last observation just to build on a point that was made earlier around uh, efficiency. Well, virtual trials mean that trials are, are cheaper. Um, and I think that in the near term, uh, one could envision that at best this is cost neutral. That in the near term, for most trials, location is shifted, but the procedures are still being done. The work is still being done. At best, you may have less overhead associated with institutions being involved. Maybe there are indirect savings that one can start to try to uh, aspire towards um, around speed for recruitment maybe around retention, but in terms of direct cost savings, I think the opportunity there is a bit more over time. The opportunity over time that patients can use more technology that they're already wearing, like the devices on Donna's wrist right now, rather than having to provision more and more technology and hardware, or in ways that um, more of the uh, opportunity of virtual trials gets more closely embedded with, with how healthcare is being delivered, enabling us to capture more uh, data from existing systems. Uh, in particular, in the, I can't even say it as a future state, the current state where patients in the U.S. are empowered with remarkable access to their health data as they've never had before, and how that it can be a, a catalyst for increased efficiency as patients can bring more of their health data in rather than requiring the redundancy of simply re-entering data that was already captured once in the first place. I'll stop there. Thanks.